What's going on, everybody out there? I'm Jay Campbell, and he is Hunter Williams. What is what's up? going on? Uh, we are here today to do this podcast on the new Andrew Huberman benefits and risks of peptide therapeutics for physical and mental health. I love how they use the uh, the Google <laughs> search Q tags or whatever to come up with the best podcast. And we can tell all of you guys out there before we get into dissecting this whatever it is podcast that it's already the number one podcast on YouTube for peptide information, which is in in intensely and seriously laughable hunter, right? Well, yeah. Considering like that you've published thousands, I've had thousands at this point, my old channel is deleted of videos about peptides. So I'm um, not throwing shade or anything, but it's kind of funny within 12 hours. It's the number one ranking video on peptides when you search peptides out, but uh, so it goes in the matrix. So it goes in the matrix. So, um, so I'm going to play this and share the screen with you guys for a second. And then Hunter and I are basically going to do 45 minutes, maybe 60 minutes of a dissection of the whole thing. Hunter has watched the entire video. I've watched bits and pieces of it. Um, but we're ready to, to go through basically the comments that he's made that essentially, you know, casting shade or dispersions or whatever you want to say proves that he knows nothing about peptides. But I'll play this the beginning of this. Uh, for you guys, so you guys can watch this. I'm going to play it right now. You see it on the screen, Hunter? Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. Peptides are a topic that's receiving a lot of attention these days, in part because of the excitement about the so-called GLP-1 analogs or agonists. GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptides. These are drugs used to treat type 2 diabetes as well as drugs used to treat obesity. Today, we are not going to discuss the GLP-1 analogs. However, we are going to discuss some of the other peptides that are receiving a lot of attention. Now, I'm hitting pause just to my audience so that you guys know that he is literally reading this from a teleprompter. Let's be very, very clear that this is professionally prepared for him and polished, and he is reading from a teleprompter. I want everybody to aware from this, you will never, ever see me and Hunter reading from a teleprompter when we talk about prop subject matter that we're experts in and what i mean experts in for all of you guys that are not familiar with hunter and i we have literally more than 30 years combined using therapeutic peptides on ourselves okay no bs we don't search reddit or google literally i've been using therapeutic peptides since 2004 since they first came out from underground places like southern research company and hunter's been using them since he found me which is close to 10 years now so between us we're close to 30 years using therapeutic peptides okay not searching google or reddit forums or wherever to get this information which is clear where he gets his information i'm going back to playing mention these days including peptides for tissue healing and repair, as well as peptides that impact longevity and vitality. Now, in principle, any discussion about peptides could be enormously vast, and that's because there are so many different kinds of peptides. And by the way, I will explain what a peptide is in just a few moments. But for instance, insulin, which is involved in regulating our blood sugar or blood glucose levels, is a peptide. Oxytocin, which is sometimes called the love hormone, although I wouldn't say that's the best description of what oxytocin is. It's a neuropeptide slash hormone that is involved in everything from pair bonding to socialization, but a bunch of other things as well. Those are just two examples of peptides that are familiar to most people, at least by name, and that exist within the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different peptides that exist within our brain and body. Today's discussion is going to... All right, I'm stopping it again because, Hunter, I, you know, look, I, it's pretty clear to me that you're listening to a person who's reading information that they're not familiar with. It's obvious from his body language. Uh, he doesn't know jack shit about peptides. I've already said that. I said that to my email list two weeks ago when we found out that this podcast was coming. And again, his body language as he's reading some of this information is just very, very, you know, outspoken, saying, claiming literally through body language um, that I am not familiar with this stuff and I have all of this stuff prepared and I am reading this. What, what is your take on that? Yeah. I mean, that's, you're going to see through the entirety of the video, that's more or less kind of the theme here. Um, at the end of the day, you know, Jay and I's mission is to help bring people to learn and understand how to use peptides on themselves. And much like we're going to sum up in this video, this is more or less like confusion, obfuscation and distortion of what peptides are. And I think the average person that is just trying to 
lose fat, build muscle, be healthier, have more energy, all the things that peptides are amazing for doing for, if they're like the reason that Jan are doing this is because those people out there that are starting to like dip their toes in the water and try to find this stuff. And they're trying to do everything right. They're trying to eat right. They're trying to diet right. They're trying to learn peptides. They're going to leave listening to this podcast absolutely more confused than they would if they just wouldn't have listened to it all together. So the reason we're doing this is like Jay said, we're going to like kind of take point by point what he's talking about. But like Jay said, you're going to hear a lot of these like buzzwords that he's saying neuropeptides, uh, receptors, oxytocin. all these yeah. oxytocin, hormone, nor neuropeptides, all those things. Um, yes, there's a place for like scientific understanding, but don't miss the forest for the trees. Peptides are something that everybody should and can use. And we teach you how to navigate this landscape so that you can listen to us and take, you know, information that we publish for free and go out into the wild green pastures and never have to listen to anything Jay or I say for the rest of your life about peptides. Whereas this is going to make you more confused than we to begin with. So um, that's just kind of my thoughts getting kicked off. Okay. So let's just, for the purposes of uh, this show, making, you know, pick, taking all the high relevant points. And again, you know, both of us have a thesis or an overriding arc, arcing narrative that this podcast does not do him any favors. It does not show him as an expert. And we're going to break that down. How, but again, just by me listening to him and looking at his body language, as he goes over some of these topics and these scientific buzzwords, it's clear to me that he literally doesn't have any clue about using peptides. And I would actually say Hunter, and I think we can go, this isn't going out on a limb. I don't think he's ever used peptides in his life. And we can prove that in one second. And I've obviously said that in the past with other emails that I've done because he talks about Sermorellin and that's obviously where we're going to. So obviously we've broken down guys, a group of 19 topics through the entire video that we are going to now uh, surgically dissect for your benefit that proves that he doesn't really truly have a great grasp of peptides and that, you know, to back that up, that he's not obviously using them. And the first one, do you want me to scan, uh, speed to that is in 1250, which is where you are endorsing Sir Morell. Do you want me to just move to that? Or do we just want to talk? Yeah, about just, it just hop to that and play real quick. I think it's like at 1250. Uh, what I kind of summed up, he's like talking about Sir Morell. And so just let people hear what he says about Sir Morell, And then we'll yep. just talk about it because we know. Gotcha, it. But it is often now prescribed for other things as well, where a physician and their patient agree that augmenting the growth hormone pathway would be useful. Now, regardless of the specific use in mind, it's absolutely clear that the safest and best situation, if one is going to use therapeutic peptides, is to use prescription therapeutic peptides where the prescription comes from a board certified physician. And the reason for that is several fold. Why does it have to be a board certified physician? Why can't it just well, be a physician? <laughs> well, exactly. So actually play... Play this next minute, dude, because I want you to hear what he says about black market peptides and lipopolysaccharides. Yeah, yeah, so I want yeah. You to hear this. It's perfect. So. I, I screwed up, but it, this is the universe making sure that I didn't screw yeah. up. Well, first of yeah. all, sometimes these peptides come from pharma companies. Other times they are made by a compounding pharmacy. But in both situations, they are cleaned of what's called lipopolysaccharide or LPS. LPS is something that can accumulate in the manufacturing process of some of these peptides. And it's something that you really want to remove from the peptide before you ingest it or inject it. Most peptides are injected either subcutaneously or into the muscle, although some can be taken orally or even a topical cream. We'll talk a little bit about different modes of delivery a little bit later. In any case, getting the LPS out and making sure that the peptide is pure is very important. The reason is that LPS causes an immune response. And while a tiny amount of LPS might not cause a massive immune response, the accumulation of many, many LPS exposures can start to become problematic. And the other sources of peptides, which are gray market and black market, oftentimes do contain the same peptide that one would get from a prescription from a board certified physician, but very often they haven't cleaned out the lipopolysaccharide. They haven't removed the LPS and that can. Okay. I want to stop it right there. Now, where does he get that information? And by the way, where, when, like, where was that information coming from and who in the, in the research chemical community is not actually uh, removing the LPS? Well, here, here's the thing, dude, maybe some research, research chemical, you literally could get everything you want. You could order like, you know, Sarah Morellin from Andrew Huberman's recommendation from a research chemical company, <laughs> and you could literally get sawdust in a vial. We don't know. Right. But however, research chemical companies, really good ones, will publish their HPLC with the batch number and exactly what the test came back of what's in there. And ones that we know that are good, 
I've been using for years and years, and I haven't gotten an antibody immune response that caused me to get irritated or have some sort of autoimmune reaction or anything like that. So I don't know where this is coming from other than maybe like a Reddit form or something that somebody said, but I don't know that, like, I, have you ever had an experience from a research company where you've had like contamination or something like that? No, like he's talking no. about. And, and, and again, look, you know, we wrote about this in the book. We write about this. We talk about this in our course. Uh, you know, we talk about this in our, in our lives and our, obviously our, our private membership group, which is fully optimized I mean, I've been using peptides since 2004. I've used pretty much every peptide under the sun that was you know beneficial to me in some capacity from a performance enhancement, cognitive enhancement, fat loss enhancement, uh, muscle building, you know, all the different things, healing. And I've never, ever had any kind of reaction to LPS. I'm familiar with what that is. And I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad that he actually brought that up. And he mentioned that because you're right. There are a lot of fly-by-night shady peptide companies. So if there's a message or a take home to what he's saying is that is make sure you're getting your peptides from a trusted source, whether it is from a compound pharmacy and a board certified physician's prescription, or you're getting it from a research chemical company like limitless life nootropics there are others peptide sciences so just again you know make sure that you're getting your information from the right place and also you're getting your peptides from a place that obviously is again doing as you said hlpc testing um and purity uh process and sterility control of their peptides um all right do you want to fast forward to the next one because this is the one that really irks me yeah so go to 2050 and he's going to be talking about um, BPC-157 basically like only being uh, studied in animal models. This is insane, by the way. All right, I'm going to get to 2035. Yeah, Tissues yeah, are right. impacted. And one of the things that BPC-157 has been shown to do in animal studies, and I really want to emphasize animal studies, because that's where the vast, vast, vast majority of data on BPC-157 come from. Well, it's been shown to increase blood flow to a given area by virtue of increased angiogenesis. So basically to promote the development of new blood vessels to the entire injury site. And the way it does that is very interesting. BPC-157 somehow is able to recognize injured blood vessels and injured capillaries, and then to promote the activity of a given enzyme called ENOS or endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which then causes more blood vasculature to form at the injury site and around the injury site. That in turn allows- I gotta give him credit. Nobody has ever used the word ENOS, which is endothelial nitric oxide <laughs> synthesis. So give him props on that. As for the delivery, not just of blood, but for the stuff that's contained within blood, including growth factors that then promote the further rejuvenation of different cell types in the given area. So the things that could potentially lead to repair of muscle, repair of ligament, repair of tendon, et cetera. And then BP. Okay. So again, he's reading this. Somebody has prepared this for him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a command from a person who has used BPC-157 at any time in their life to heal themselves. In fact, I would wager my life on it that he hasn't. Now, I will well, say that anybody who has used BPC-157, which both you and I have many times in our lives, as at former athletes, as you know, competitive uh, weightlifters, bodybuilders, strength trainers, whatever the fuck we are nowadays, we have hurt ourselves from training from, you know, just making ra random, you know, haphazard uh, movements and you, you know, tear something, sprain something, strain something, and we've used it and it is magical. So, I mean, like, I want you to comment, but evidently he goes, you know, to go deeper on BPC and we can skip ahead. He talk starts talking about how BPC is literally a placebo uh, effect. And that is literally insane. Well, yeah. So I'll just say this and we'll skip to, uh, if you want to skip to 27 minutes while I'm saying this, but he, sure. basically he's saying that all of the clinical data or most of the clinical data is all in rodent models or animal models, which is true, but we have millions, not thousands, but millions of anecdotal reports of human beings using this for extended periods of time to heal and get results beyond what they normally would have. So I want people to understand because if you worship at the altar of scientific studies, you will never be able to do anything with your life as it relates to health because you're going to be stuck in analysis paralysis of like, well, this isn't like scientifically studied or whatever. You don't add, if you want to be like Huberman and say like science is my God or whatever, if you don't add to the knowledge set of science through experimentation on your own self with things that are very clearly safely studied in other humans that Jay and I have used for years that we know people have used for decades now, then 
there's not really any helping you. So I want to try to deprogram people, not in a mean way, but if you say, well, like there's not human clinical data on this, then uh, there's just not really like, okay, we'll have fun healing, you know, it. Yeah. Three well, let's times just, let's just play it so we can like insert foot and mouth with pure <laughs> placebo effect, or we're, we are dealing with real effects. And so because of the lack of the human clinical studies, we don't know whether or not we're dealing with a situation of robust placebo effects. I did an episode all about placebo effects and placebo effects are, and can be oh so real. They really um, can really trick you into thinking that a given compound is doing something when in fact it's not doing anything different than would an injection of saline, of salt. Oh my God. Now, people that are watching this podcast, this proves that everything I've said up until this point is true that he has no idea about peptides. He's never injected BPC-157 because any person, Hunter, who ever had used BPC-157 on an injury, injected locally at the origin of the injury, whatever it was, an ankle sprain, a tendon sprain, an elbow sprain. You know, guys, I've known guys have torn their distal bicep in two places and injected right into the the, the tendon, the, the bicep tendon and, and reattached the bicep tendon. I mean, again, anyone familiar with the usage of BPC-157, and obviously you can throw in TB-500, thymus and beta-500 with it to suppress inflammation, would not be saying what he's saying. I, I mean, this is like coming from a place of, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I've never used these products because if you did Hunter, you would not be complaining or, 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 or uh, saying that they were placebo. And yes, you and I know what placebo is. We understand the majority of bros out there use products their whole life, like glutamine. I mean, I could go on and on and on all these things and say that they work wonders. And it's obviously a placebo effect. They're training hard. They're eating enough protein. They're getting enough rest, blah, blah, blah. But this is BPC-157, this is like the Wolverine healing peptide compound that we all know about. I've literally healed injuries since 2008 and 2009 when people first started using BPC. So to hit for him to say this in this podcast and go out to the 5.27 million people that listen to him, he's just giving them abject nonsense, bro. Yeah, I mean, it'd be kind of like saying the sky is blue is placebo effect. Technically I can't disprove that that like the sky is blue is placebo effect. But at the same time, we all can agree that I've seen thousands at this point of people that I've worked with or wherever that have used BPC 157 to improve the speed at which they're healing. And a lot of times stave off surgery. So again, it goes back to like, overall, like most of us would agree, of course, BPC 157 isn't placebo. It, it, what He calls it like, you know, big, placebo, like a big range placebo effect or whatever. Um, but I think it goes back to trying to obfuscate and confuse and right. uh, distort what peptides really are. All so we have is animal models. Yeah. So that the person is trying to, you know, discern for themselves whether peptides are right, because everyone's got to do that. You know, like Jay and I can't do that for you. You have to discern whether peptides are right for you. When you hear that, it creates like a fear, like, oh, it's just placebo right. effect. Well, they're probably not like getting that much better from it. It's just placebo effect to which like, if I say like you have a torn shoulder or a torn knee or something like, don't you want to heal? Don't you want to not have to potentially get surgery or have like an improved recovery time? So it's really sad because I think BPC-157 is basically like the gateway peptide to like introduce people to right. this world right. and everything because it's so safe, it's so effective and everyone gets benefit from it, you know, across so many different uh, parts of health with the body. And he's just confusing people that much more, which is sad. Well, so just, and we'll go to the next thing here in a second, but you know, just speed up. He also talks about the mode of administration on BPC that 157 doesn't matter. That's complete bullshit. Again, it's just more proof that he doesn't know anything about peptides. He does not use peptides. Why do people in the world listen to people who don't have personal experience. This is like the idiots that go out and work with doctors for therapeutic testosterone or hormone optimization. If you're a woman who isn't actually using it on themselves either. It's like, if you're that stupid that you are going to trust, trust your doctor, the lab coat God, if you're going to trust a doctor who doesn't know anything about utilizing therapeutic hormones on themselves, then you're going to be the same kind of person that's going to trust a guy like this dude who's clearly never used peptides before, but can go and regurgitate in staged prep, standing in front of a teleprompter with a black background and a black shirt, probably casting black source and sorcery on you. I don't know. That's, you know, for you to decide. Rampant but like, speculation. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, like the reality is, is like, why would you listen to this dude? I am a 20 year 
user of peptides. If there's anyone on this planet that can say is an expert of using different peptides, it would be me, Hunter, close to 10 years. Combined, we got close to 30. We're here to tell you what peptides work, how they work. You know, we're not sitting here regurgitating Google or, you know, Google doctor or any of these other things where he's getting all this quote unquote science from, you know, again, it's all science that is, you know, mainstream accepted by allopathic or the, the, uh, the FDA or the DEA or the AMA or whatever alphabet, you know, acronym you want to use. But at the end of the day, he's making statements that clearly show that he doesn't use peptides, especially the ones he's talking about. The last thing is, and this is, we've heard this for a decade, bro. BPC-157 will increase tumor growth. Now, again, show me any person who's ever used heavy, you know, call them heroic dosages of BPC-157 that got a tumor or a cancer from it. I've not seen it. I haven't heard it. Again, is it technically, theoretically possible? Of course. It's theoretically possible, bro, that you and I can walk out of our house tonight and get hit by anything in our neighborhood and die. But that's not going to tell people. It's, it's like what you just said. It's going back to setting people up to be fearful of these products. That's what it's doing. That's what, his that's, intent is. that's what this is because right now I can list off 10 things. I could say there is fluoride in every piece of tap water that you drink. Are you not going to drink water right. when you're out at a restaurant or something? I could say right. glyphosate increases chances of right. um, all these different autoimmune diseases and leaky gut and everything. What are you going to never eat something with glyphosate on it again? So like, of course, there's a possibility that anything can do anything. But if you are constantly reinforcing to people cancer, 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 all these different things. Again, it goes back to like preventing someone from being able to discern for themselves. Like you could, why doesn't he talk on other podcasts about Yerba Mate potentially increasing cancer risk? Why doesn't he talk about all these other things that could potentially damage and cause cancer or do all these things? And, you know, I don't really listen to him. Like we're just doing this because it was like a, a yeah. famous thing, but like, I'm just saying like, you can't, you don't want to like reinforce all of this stuff that's just like not really relevant that's in practice. You know what I mean? Like, you know, every prescription medication, if you read the label insert, there's what an average of like 200 side it's effects insane, for, dude. on prescription insane. medications. But I don't see them like banging the drum of, you know, like Zoloft and the prescription, you know, side effects for that that are causing. I mean, look, people. man, it's obvious that Andrew Huberman, Dr. Andrew Huberman at the Huberman lab, where they teach you about science, that he comes from a mainstream point of view. And the mainstream thinks that peptides will kill you. The peptides don't have any human studies. The peptides are animal models only. The peptides are fringe and blah, blah, blah. I mean, bro, you and I both know that the average orthopedic surgeon in the United States is fucking ignorant of peptides. They are literally still performing high expensive cost surgeries in elderly age. Let's just call them aging men and women that have a high rate of failure that they make a lot of money on when they could easily just uh, write a script for PPC 157 and TB 500 instead of having an ACL or a PCL or an MCL or a shoulder reconstruction or all these places that they just unnecessarily cut the human body. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a landscape now where there's a massive bifurcation. You're either, you understand peptides, you listen to people like us who teach you how to use peptides or you don't. And you listen to guys like this dude who comes from the mainstream, who has a black shirt on and a doctor, you know, PhD or whatever he is at a lab telling you that it's all about science. And, and, and then you get into fear because the fear-based people in the science side of the world will say there's no studies. And in the world that you and I live in, you are your own study. You are a biochemically unique individual who's an N of one. And what works for you might not work for me. What works for Hunter might not work for me. What works for me might not work for Hunter. It's very, very simple. But if you're going to watch this podcast and you're going to listen to this dude talk about animal studies only, no, you know, human studies are not available, high risk, causes tumors, may case, cause cancer. We're about to go to HGH in a second because we obviously love talking about that you're going to be in fear. And once you go into fear, you're going to have the paralysis and the indecision of not being able to actually probably use peptides. You'll probably watch this podcast, Hunter, and I want you to comment on this. And if, again, you're a mainstreamer, a normie, you're not using these things, and you listen to Andrew Huberman, which is majority of his audience, you're probably going to come away from this podcast and say, oh my God, peptides are too dangerous. Well, yeah, that's what I try to do when I watch through this is put on because obviously we understand this stuff. I try to put on my thinking cap of like, 
you know, I'm someone in my forties and fifties. I'm really successful. I notice like my healing starting to slow down. My fat loss ability is starting to slow down and I'm looking for like that extra edge. Cause I'm doing everything right. I'm training, right. I'm eating right. You know, within, you know, 80 to 90% of the time. And I'm listening to this. And if I'm one of these people, all I get from this is fear from peptides right. and fear, fear and uncertainty about what's happening. Um, so I have on the, those notes, dude, uh, I had it 38 minutes is the end of the yeah, I'm going to get to that. But as I'm scrolling through, you'll love this. I mean, this is what you see safety, cycling, tumor risk. I mean, think about this. This is all literally created to incite fear in the end user, in the person who's watching this, who knows nothing about peptides, who's listening to a person who doesn't even use peptides. I mean, bro, this is where the mainstream world is. They well, are to so disconnected. Dude, to that point where he, so that's that uh, chapter title is safety uh, cycling and doses. He doesn't explain proper cycling at all of like why you would use BPC 157 for eight to 12 weeks and then take time off because of the antibody response you're going to get from it, which is going right. to cause the downregulation of the receptors. But he which doesn't is going talk about it because he doesn't know about it. Exactly. And that's what like people wouldn't understand is like, okay. I think before you would ever have like risk of tumor from BPC-157, you're just not going to be able to take enough because the dose is going to like wean itself out from being efficacious because once you take it for 12, 16 weeks at a time, it becomes really, really ineffective, which he doesn't really explain. And so this is the thing I have at, at the ahead, end of the TB-500, he kind of glosses over TB-500, but he doesn't talk about why it's synergistic with BPC-157. So like, BPC-157 works in isolation. TB-500 works really well in isolation. When you pair them together- In a lab. I love it. Go, keep going. Well, the angiogenesis and the tissue repair and the reduction in inflammation that those two have when paired together work synergistically. So it's like a one plus one equals right. three effect. And he always, he just says these are like two starter peptides, but he doesn't introduce the concept of like how peptides work synergistically together to enhance results as opposed to- just in isolation. So I would, it would have been nice. Like I was hoping just for like people's education, they would say like, here's why we use BPC and TB together. Cause you don't really use like BPC, you know, and like, you know, like some crazy, like uh kiss peptin peptide together. Right. But you I, would think, put Hunter, I think we should just stop the podcast right now and you should check your phone because I just got the Cassiopeian experiment. The underground was part two notification. <laughs> not, not that that's not relevant or anything for you guys in the know, but no, but to keep going with what you're saying, um, I'll, I can press play real quick and let him talk about TB 500, but everything you said is hundred percent accurate. But again, I will just say this is coming from a person who does not use peptides. They are not an authority on peptides. They are not an expert on peptides. Nobody that stands in front of a podium, especially one like this, that is a transcript, not a transcription, but a teleprompter with a black background that's been highly edited multiple times, does not demonstrate mastery of anything, let alone peptides. And again, coming from two people who are experts of peptides, we're telling you right now that it's obvious that he is literally just repeating, quote unquote, textbook science. It's not relevant to the world world in people that are ultimately choosing to use peptides. And look, most people that watch this, bro, are not going to be normies. Nobody that's in the normie world watches the stuff that you and I put out there. But thankfully, there are a lot of people that are not normies that do watch ours and that are you know catching on to us because they are finding out that we are actually real credible people who have been using these products and give, give people really good advice. We obviously have our course. We have our private membership group. The book is out there. There's all sorts of stuff that proves our credibility. And again, you don't have to believe us. We're just two guys talking to you on a podcast right now. Talk to the people that work with us. Talk to the people in our private membership group. Talk to the thousands of people who have purchased the courses over the last two or three years. So I just think it's funny because, again, as somebody you know who, who, who does not watch Andrew Huberman, obviously, uh, but does write emails about him because my team sends me funny things. And obviously, we were, we've been waiting for this because we knew that, the, bro, we knew exactly what this was going to be. And he has not let us down. You know, if we wanted to go through this bit by bit, point by point in this podcast, we could do a much deeper, you know, evisceration of this content. But at the end of the day, dude, it's staged content. This is what sells on the internet today. People like to listen to people that appear to be polished, reading a teleprompter, you know, talking about words or using words that they have really no personal 
uh, or firsthand familiarity with. Yeah, he's a scientist. He's a doctor or whatever. He went to Stanford. But at the end of the day, he does not have a mastery of these concepts or these peptides because, bro, he's not using them. That is obvious when you listen to this. Yeah, I was. By the finest, you know, and then adults take ahead. it. Okay. Or TB500, which is this truncated, slightly shortened version of thymosin beta 4, which acts similarly to thymosin beta 4, but has a kind of different mode of action, lasts a little bit longer, et cetera. Now, again, we're in a situation where there are. Notice how he literally has to go down to look at the notes, even though he's still reading from a teleprompter and then stops and then it's edited again. I mean, honestly, like, I don't know what people find in listening to someone who doesn't truly have a mastery of the topic. Let's just keep vast going. amounts of animal data studies on mice or rats typically that show that thymosin beta four <laughs> can increase the rate and or thoroughness of wound healing and repair. He just read that literally out of probably my book or seeds book or something. I mean, I mean, it's just, is just to me incredible. But again, there are more and more people now taking thymosin beta four for the purposes of tissue rejuvenation and repair and report positive effects. Now, when we say positive effects, we have to stand back and say, well, um, what's the control experiment? Well, you know, how would they know how quick? What? <laughs> what? Well, if you, you play, if you play it, well, he's going to say like, well, we really can't do a control experiment because we'd have no way of them having an injury if they like didn't use it to help heal, which is kind of dumb because like people can right. have the you same just injury. Talked about the placebo before. Bro. Yeah. And people could also like tear both. Like I've talked to people that have like torn an ACL and not use peptides. And then years later they tear another ACL and they use peptides. You're like, wow, the amazing like difference between how fast I healed when I had the AC AC or ACL tear before versus now. But again, it's just more about like confusion and obfuscation. Well, look, like, dude, you know. so, so look, so Ben Greenfield, you know, shout out to Ben. We love Ben. He wrote an article about the Wolverine healing stack, you know, before we Seven started writing ago, about probably. it, yeah, before before I started yeah. writing about it on Jay Campbell, and obviously we went deep, deeper and then we wrote the book, but like, this is not placebo, okay? I want the people watching this to understand that this is insane that he is going from placebo at BPC-157 and then talking about TB-400. And by the way, nobody's using TB-400 anymore. That, that's old school. We're all into the 500 range now, and they're the same thing. But at the end of the day, it's like, where is the logic? I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, how do you support that it's a placebo with one peptide, but then you start going into it works, and here's what people are saying. I mean, where, where is the logic in that? I don't, again, I don't, is logic part of this? Right. <laughs> like, is, is, right. is it supposed to be logical? I don't know. I would hope. Hopefully they would heal without the thymus and beta four. And there's simply no way to address that question. You know, my whole purpose in doing this episode is to highlight how these different molecules ought to work, how they've been shown to work in animal models and the shown to work in animal models. So there he goes. He's absolutely admitting that all the people that have been using peptides for decades, which there are many of them, including ourselves, we don't count, bro, because there's no studies around our usage, right? I mean, that's basically what he's admitting. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? That old saying, you know, and it's like, again, it goes back to like the practical application. Like, would you rather learn business school from a professor? Or would you rather learn business from like someone who owns their own business? Right. Those things kind of like, the, it goes back to the same thing. And some people, All right, should I just skip through this? Is there anything else? I'll just go to the, because we want to get into um, GH. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. That's it for that. And we can talk about the GH stuff because that's all I had for the healing peptides. All right. I'm going to skip up to the 45 and I'm going to let you talk about yeah, this because I think this that. is absolutely insane. This is really I'll important. Do. Yeah. This is really important for people to understand because this is, you know, the healing things are one thing, but like growth hormone is going to be overall well being. And he Why says some no stuff in here. That, Florida drivers. Sorry about that. He says some stuff in here about growth hormone. It's definitely true, but I want to like sort out the, like what I would call disinformation or um, obfuscation. I just got the damn ad. So am I going to have to play that, play it? To get yeah. The just, I think you can do like four, three, two, one, where it's got the timer on there. And then it's about this through. new rule. Sorry. If you are currently insured, drive no, less than 50 miles. All right, now we're good. We can skip that. Yeah. Keep in mind that growth hormone is indiscriminate with respect to which tissues it grows. So if you happen to have an existing tumor on a given body part or within a given body part, it will encourage growth of that tumor as well. That's one of the reasons pe some people are cautious about taking growth hormone. Okay, that is absolutely positively not true. 
Now, I have actually done podcasts with doctors who are far more advanced in their knowledge of uh, growth hormone than Dr. Huberman is. And they've all said in their patients to a man that the dose, the difference between a pill and a poison is always the dosage. And a surgically precise dosage of human growth hormone is not going to exacerbate tumor formation in the majority of humans. Now, again, growth hormone has been studied in humans for a long time. It's obviously been studied in children, as you know, who have dwarfism and growth problem or growth plate issues. And they've used massively high dosages in these children and they do not get tumors or cancers or any of this stuff. So again, this is fear porn again, bro. This well, is, I would say this is fear, fear to come to fear. come with a little science. And uh, I'm not a scientist by any means. If we were to look at that and say like, okay, let's give credence to like growth hormone may increase tumor formation. There is zero yes. lack of acknowledging the insulin pathway in relation right. to right. the growth hormone. What do we know also causes cancer to grow? Glucose. High what levels is, of insulin. Yes. Exactly. And we know that there is a connection between growth hormone and insulin. So can you say growth hormone causes cancer or is it growth hormone in the presence of rampant runaway insulin signaling? Which is the average have? American dumpster fire human who literally exactly. has overwhelmed <laughs> blood sugar and insulin because they do not live insulin controlled. Right, dude. And I'm glad also, there's, said there's this too, because this is like a question I have. Again, I don't have all the answers, but I have a question. I think the right questions will lead us to the right answers. Why do all people that usually get cancer after the age of 50 – Look at their growth hormone and IGF right. levels. Right. Zero. Because after the age yeah. of 50, your levels fall off a cliff. So if growth hormone is so prevalent and likely to cause cancer, why do all the people that cause cancer or have cancer usually have very low levels of growth hormone and very low levels of IGF-1? I don't know, but let's talk about that as it relates to science instead of just saying growth hormone causes tumor well, formation. Let's, let's hit you play know? right now so he can put his foot in his mouth. Hold on. Another reason why many people are cautious about taking growth hormone is that it is subject to what's called negative feedback. If your blood levels of growth hormone are too high by virtue of injecting growth hormone, well, then the pituitary can register that and the brain can register that. And then there's a negative feedback that shuts down growth hormone. As a consequence, people- Okay. So Hunter, you and I have put this to bed. I mean, again, he's He's just regurgitating the quote unquote ex accepted science about how growth hormone or, or taking exogenous human growth hormone shuts down the body's pituitary, which is obviously where uh, growth hormone is produced in the human body. It shuts down the endogenous production and it leads to blah, 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 all these issues and, 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 and problems. Whereas you and I now have been using human growth hormone for f close to oh, shit, dude, close to three and a half years. Uh, and I used it before that when it wasn't pharma grade and it was the bro kind of like Chinese bodybuilding way back in the day. And I didn't use it for a long time. I used it for a short amount of time, but it was real, even though it's low grade, low quality compared to pharma. And we have found that in cycling growth hormone and using it intermittently and taking tests of IGF-1 and obviously other biomarkers, it does not, I will repeat, it does not shut down the body's endogenous production of human growth hormone relative to the dosage and the response. And again, you go, you know, talking about insulin, if you're living insulin controlled, you're using metformin, you're using dihydroberberin, you're again, you're regulating your carbohydrate intake, you're fasting, you're increasing autophagy, hormesis, all these other things. You are not going to shut down your pituitary's production of growth hormone, but which, which is important in what you already said, relative to your age, you might not have that much anyway, right? Especially Hunter, and nobody's talking about this, living in the contaminated world and environments that we are all living in, especially people living in first world industrialized societies like the US, like the EU, you know, again, other Canada other westernized places where everything is, you know, contaminated in your environment. So it's like, he's just, again, he's, he's just regurgitating what the consensus is in the allopathic medical community about using growth hormone. Uh, as I've said before, uh, a very famous surgeon once said to me in 2014, that if met, if growth hormone and metformin were in the water supply, there would be very few hospitals. And that is absolutely true. So, I mean, again, fear, 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 dude. It's going to well, shut down your natural production. If you use it, you're going to be screwed because then your body won't make anymore. I mean, it's the same old shit, bro. Well, so here's here's the question too. 
can we ask what what growth hormone production? Because if we're shutting it right. off, what are we shutting off? Because if it's right. over, he's going to mention in this podcast over the age of 30, you basically, he'll even, he, he admits this, like your growth hormone production plummets off of a cliff. So if we're worried about pervert, preserving something that's barely there, what's the point of preserving it? Oh, wait, because we don't want people to use growth hormone because it's very safe. It's very efficacious at a surgically precise dose to help people lose fat, build muscle, stay young, and like optimize immune function and all the amazing things that growth hormone does. So again, it just goes back. The, the question I have for you, dude, do you think that's actually more of a bro science myth than it is scientifically proven that it shuts down pituitary function? Well, so put it this way, it has to be because... Uh, but you brought it up. And, and so, so what I understand about growth hormone goes back to the life extension foundation, right? They don't have a lot of science that they publish, but they do have science amongst users and they do track people that are using it. And I will definitely tell you that the majority of life extension foundation people that took growth hormone back in the seventies and eighties, and then it was, you know, Dr. Jeffrey life. And he was all over the newspapers in the nineties, you know, showing that 70 year old guy who was using growth hormone, had a six pack and you could live, you know, forever too with using human growth hormone. Those people were wealthy people for the most part, and they did not live insulin controlled. We did, they did not understand we, they or we, or the scientific community did not understand insulin control and living with, you know, better glucose management and they weren't using metformin for the most part. So most of these people, bro, were using growth hormone as a panacea. The dosages were probably all over the board too. Some of these people were probably using four or five IUs a day. And again, if you're not living insulin controlled, you're not using metformin or dihydroberberin or other glucose suppressors, uh, you're going to get diabetes. You're going to get, you know, they call it gestational diabetes from using growth hormone. I've seen that too, where like you'd see like older people who've been using growth hormone for 30 years, again, wealthy back in the eighties and nineties. And they have like a layer of visceral body fat right around their belly. And it was kind of weird. It was squishy. And again, this is from the insulin resistance that they were building up to the injecting of the growth hormone, but you're not going to have that problem if you're living insulin controlled and you're doing all the things that obviously we recommend, you know, in the God stack and all of our courses and our books and all of our writings and all the stuff inside of our, our course, our private membership group. So at the end of the day, it's a good question. But again, we have now seen that if you use a dosage of growth hormone, that's anywhere from like one to two to one and a half IUs of growth hormone, and you use it, you know, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, take a couple days off a week, depending on your age, um, you're not going to shut your body's natural production of growth hormone down again, relative to your age, and whether or not your body is even producing IGF. But there's absolutely no scientific proof or evidence anywhere. There are clearly no studies, which he probably mentions in this, you know, in adult age humans that are looking for optimization. But Hunter, they do have massive amounts of research in kids that were suffering from dwarfism. And the side effects that are very known and announced are acromalgy, right? And acromalgy is, a, is the oversize or the over increase of the skeletal structure. You know, usually it appears in the face or it can appear in the forehead. And again, that's because these kids, bro, are taking like 25 IUs a day before their growth plates have uh, closed because they're dwarfs or they're, they, they expect them to be dwarfs and they want them to be, to reach natural size in adulthood as a male or female. So I don't think anyone knows. I think it's speculative to your original question. I think that the bros would say that because they were using massive dosages. We all know that in the bro world, more is better when it comes to anabolic steroids and combining it with growth hormone and insulin and all those other things. So it's like, it's most likely comes from a place where people were overusing it, taking too high of again, called super physiologic levels or dosages. And that's where all of this came from. But again, you and I, and obviously thousands of other people that we work with have taken IGF one tests both on and off. And there is never a disturbance in IGF when you keep your dosage within a relatively call it surgically precise uh, dosage range. It just, it doesn't happen, bro. Science does not prove what people experience in real life. Interestingly enough, related to those kids that you would use like, you know, one whole pen of growth hormone every two days or whatever incidence of cancer among those kids, when you, you know, pound for pound with kids that are not actually was less than kids that exactly. did not use growth hormone. That's so, what I'm saying. Or, or it's, I'm not saying so it's good no or bad problem. for it, but there's no, exactly. We can't correlate or like you but know, what like we do know, travel. but what we do know is that the, the the medical establishment does not want people using human growth hormone. 
because again, then they would eliminate a large section of their petroleum distillate, big pharma, call them whatever Rockefeller pharmaceutical, you know, medications that do cause side effects and do cause uh, issues from other drugs and other drugs. And I mean, again, it's just, it never ends, but you know, again, I go back to what I was told. If metformin and growth hormone were in the United States water supply, there would be very few hospitals. So we know that it does a lot of really good things and it outweighs, again, when used responsibly in surgically precise dosages, all of the quote unquote high risky bad things that he's talking about on this podcast, which again, he's just repeating from the literature, bro, from the scientific inquiry slash evidence that has been out there for a long time, which doesn't equate to people who are actually using it day to day. Uh, if you want to go, can I go to Sir Morellan? Yeah. So jump to 49 minutes. Um, and he's got, I think he said Sir Morellan, you should only use once per week, which, um, we're going to talk about, cause he mentions a couple other things around. We'll just talk time. about Sir Morellan, dude, because in truth, like nobody even uses Sir Morellan anymore. I mean, it was old school in the pharmaceutical space because the compounders were making it because in the studies, it shows it to be as good as Ipamorellan. But in the real world, for people that use Sermorellin and Ipamorellin, nobody's going to take Ipam or use Sermorellin over Ipamorellin. Let me get to where he's talking about it real <clears> quick here. All right, I'll push play here. Actually, I didn't go far enough. 49, 17, there we go. Or deep sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep is critical for all sorts of things that deep sleep can't achieve and vice versa. So you really want both. So this is one reason why I've basically stopped taking Sermorellin. I'll occasionally take it every once in a while. But in general, I just you know, stop taking it because, uh, whatever the positive effects might've been, if I had taken it more consistently, the effects in depleting rapid eye movement sleep were just something I didn't want and don't want. And by the way, that effect, dude. So, so he's saying in this podcast that he does take Cermorellin to those people that are going to fact check me, but he stopped taking it because it was affecting his, his REM sleep. Is that what he's saying? Yeah. He said it, he would wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep when he took Cermorellin, which, Sounds kind of weird to me. In yeah, my I, use case of all growth hormone and growth hormone peptides, if anything, I sleep like a baby and wake up, you know, like that's what I've never heard anyone say that. That 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 sounds outlandish to me. Not saying that he doesn't experience that, because again, we're all biochemically unique and out of one, but I've never heard of anyone taking a growth hormone agonist peptide. Because remember, you got the GNRHs and the GNRRs. Like, I would not even I've never heard of that. I mean, again, I'm not saying he's lying, but I'm just saying that is outlandish because I've never heard of that. I'm playing. I'll keep playing. On increasing deep sleep, that non-REM sleep is something that's pretty well documented. The other, what I'm calling pretty type well one growth hormone promoting peptide is tesamorelin. This goes by the brand name Agrifta, and it's an FDA approved drug for the reduction of visceral adiposity in HIV patients. So we have subcutaneous fat and we have visceral fat around our organs. Visceral fat can be really problematic. And for some people who have HIV or and for people who don't have HIV, the deposits of visceral fat can be problematic for their health. All right. Just, to, just for you and I to clear this up for people, because a lot of people don't understand this. Visceral body fat is the body fat that flaming dumpster fire humans have around their internal organs. This is when you're a fat fuck. This is when you don't exercise. You don't live insulin controlled. You don't lift weights to build muscle. You have poor insulin sensitivity. You are highly insulin resistant. You eat like shit. You drink too much alcohol. You probably are drinking sodas and eating Mount, I mean, uh, ho-hos or fucking Dunkin' Donuts or, or, uh, Krispy Kremes. And you literally have led such a, you know, a, a quote unquote, a dumpster fire life that you've allowed visceral body fat and, and thick levels around to surround and, and to grow and obviously to accumulate around your internal organs and hunter, as you know, and we say this all the time, people don't believe this, but visceral body fat is actually more inflammatory than kerosene. So if you actually were able to cut visceral body fat out of a dumpster fire and you lit it on fire, you would literally be like, holy shit, it burns faster than kerosene. And again, this is the funny thing. If we're getting into the spiritual spirituality component of life, why would visceral body fat be more inflammatory than kerosene around the things that you need to survive as a spiritual being in a physical avatar body, right? So your heart, your kidneys, your lungs, you know, uh, name any other, uh, or internal organ and you have visceral body fat accumulating around it. Right. So, I mean, like what's going to lead to disease faster than that massively inflammatory substance. Now, subcutaneous fat is the kind of fat that people like you and I get 
Uh, it's due to genetics. It's due to um, stubborn uh, fat receptor sensitivity. You got the alpha, you got the A2Bs, you got the B2As, you got all these different stubborn body fat receptor uh, sites in your body, like in your belly, your love handles. For women, they have it in their glute, in their hamstrings, and their upper uh, buttocks or, or gluteal uh, tie in region. And those places is where you store subcutaneous fat. So this is a big difference from the fat that like fit people have that they struggle to get rid of. They call it stubborn body fat and visceral fat, which is again, the thick congealed fat from living like a human dumpster fire. But he's talking about that right now. And I wanted to break that down. I don't know if I've ever break, broken that down before, but did you want to add anything? Did I miss anything? Uh, just that the visceral body fat contains a infinitely higher propensity of toxins in that fat. So well all the said. toxins from the air, water, food, and everything accumulate in that fat. So this is why, like, if you eat really fatty animal meat that's not organic or anything, it's toxic because all of those toxins from the environment, the glyphosate, all the nasty, nasty stuff, it accumulates in the fat cells. And same thing for a human. When you get all those toxins from the air, the water, the food, the sugar, the beer, the, all the stuff, that accumulates in those fat cells, which is why for a fat person, it's actually harder for them to lose weight than like JRI because they have those toxins in that visceral fat cell. And it becomes very hard to burn that off because that toxicity holds to that visceral body fat and makes it like very hard to burn off. Like Jay was saying, it's, you know, like burns more rancid than kerosene. So that only that, that it's just is a higher, you know, amount of toxins in that fat than sub Q fat. I'm glad you said that because I would have literally not mentioned that. And obviously Dr. The great Dr. Anthony J talks about that all the time. Yep. <laughs> um, and that's why people in the Midwest do, that have the high levels of glyphosate and atrazine and all these other uh, industrial chemicals that are in the air struggle to lose weight because they have a, uh, a propensity of those chemicals in the visceral body fat, but that doesn't excuse you. Your lifestyle obviously still de determines because if you exercise and you live in someone controlled and you use these various peptides and growth hormone, and obviously you're hormonally optimized, you can still fight it and overcome it. You can always overcome it, but uh, I'll, I'll just keep playing what he's talking about with Tessa Morellin because we love Tessa Morellin. Let me see what he says. And Tessa Morellin, again, also called Agrifta, has been shown to reduce visceral adiposity. It also seems to produce some of the other same effects that Sermorellin produces. The differences between the two relate to small differences in the amino acid sequence for one peptide versus the other. Tessamorelin is a bit more long lasting than Sermorellin and therefore is taken typically about three times per week, not five times. What? So this is the problem <laughs> yeah. because yeah. if someone, even if they hear this and they're like, okay, I'm going to use Tessamorelin because it is a incinerator to visceral body fat. Don't get us wrong. Like Tessamorelin vastly superior to Sermorellin as it relates to burning body fat and all the other growth hormone benefits. But if you're using it three times per week, I don't know how anyone could justify it. Who does really that? Like, I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, I guess it's better than nothing, but why would you do it for three days out of the week? I mean, I don't I mean, even know who says that to him, duty. I mean, whoever does their prep work and their research, talk to some doctor that that's their cycle, right? But like you and I know, and again, I you, this goes back in my books from 2017. Tessa Morellin is one milligram AM and one milligram PM, seven days a week, until you get antibody buildup. If you're a dude and you got a lot of belly fat, it works to shred belly fat better than anything we know of, including human growth hormone. But we still recommend human growth hormone over time because, again, it doesn't lead to the antibody buildup that the peptides do. But, I mean, again, bro, I don't know what else to say. I mean, we're getting close to an hour here. We, there's, there's a couple more things we'll cover, like melanotan 1. But, again, this is just information that comes from a non-peptide user wherever he's getting his information from, you know, is somewhat sketch, somewhat okay. You know, I hear some good points. I mean, there's obviously some value in this, in this podcast. It's not that bad from a standpoint that it's useless, but again, it's designed to incite fear in newbies slash normies who are not peptide users. And he's also coming from a place of, I don't use these things uh, to, when he talks to people like you and I, and, and, and anyone who's a peptide uh, experienced user, there's just no credibility. Because you instantly tune out when you hear him start talking about things. I mean, like anybody who's ever used Tessa Morell and, and somebody would tell you that you only use it three times a week, you would literally laugh and be like, oh, that person doesn't know anything about Tessa Morell. Yeah. Well, if you can skip to 5111, I want you to listen to what he says about CJC real quick. Yeah, for sure. for sure. For sure. Yeah, right just there. Typically is only taken twice per week or even once per week because its effects on increasing growth hormone in IGF-1 last several days, which may sound great to you, especially if you're somebody that doesn't like um, 
taking injections because these things uh, in general have to be uh, delivered by injection. But keep in mind that CJC1295 has entered clinical trials. There was a death within one of the clinical trials oh, that was related to cardiovascular dysfunction. It's known to cause some fluid retention and increase fluid volume, which may be, have been related to that cardiovascular death. We don't know. Okay, Hunter, we have to say this. This is like typical medical speak. We don't know who this study was in. We don't know who was using it. But again, in large, most studies are done in non-healthy comorbid patient population groups. So how is this relevant to the people that you and I are speaking to? Maybe it is relevant to him because he's got a bunch of fat normies who've never exercised a day in their life listening to him. Maybe that's the God of science. That's who he attracts. I don't really know. But whenever I hear that, I always tune out because I'm like, this is not being done in healthy patient population groups, which are literally the people that you and I, you know, vibe and attract. So, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? No, I mean, take that out of sight because anyone can die in a medical study and you can say that it was whatever they were studying or they just died, you know, like there's no yeah. way to prove it, which he acknowledges to his credit, but you don't take CJC one, maybe two times per week, even yeah. with, um, yeah. I believe it's with DAC, which is drug affinity complex, which basically like extends the half-life that is not enough to derive any benefit. Sure. Is it better taking, taking nothing? Sure. But I just don't know where anyone's going to get any sort of like tangible real world benefit, taking it one to two times per week. That's asinine to me. And then I want you to skip right now because we're getting long, but he talks about ipamorelin increasing hunger. Now I've used ipamorelin. I've coached lots That's of people nonsense. On and I've coached lots of women because ipamorelin is amazing for women as opposed to test and it women tend to get better results with hypermorelin. And I've never heard anyone saying it no. increases their hunger. No. So that's one thing I just wanted to bring up. Well, the like next thing he says, the ne well, first off for the CJC one, two, nine, five, take it one or two times per week. You, you know, you know what you absolutely can, and you'll get absolutely zero results. You will see, <laughs> yeah, no, fat, you will see no fat loss. You will see no increased growth hormone agonist um, effects at the cellular level. You might sleep a little bit deeper but you will get no effect. Now, obviously you and I know we're not big, pro we're not big proponents of CJC one, two, nine, five, because it does create a flushing effect. It does somewhat seem like you're taking a supplement like niacin because some people get a flushing effect and some people, it's just not comfortable to take it. You know, you, that effect is just kind of, it doesn't create nausea, but you just don't feel as comfortable taking it. Not to say that if you combine it with Ipamorelin, it's a very strong GH spike. It's a very powerful GH agonist in combination. And that's why a lot of compounders, as you know, um, compound them together. A lot of research chemical companies make them together, but we're not fans. Uh, the next statement, he talks about hexarelin. It's the strongest GH releasing peptide and will turn off your system permanently. I don't need to listen to that, but I can definitely tell you that that is also coming from science because again, hexarelin is one of those peptides that in the science and the literature says it does all these things, but in the experienced end user who uses hexarelin, they don't feel it. It doesn't metabolize the same. It doesn't work in the uh, bioenergetic system the same. So I would definitely not agree with any of that as far as, and we just wrote a big article on hexarelin and all the different quote unquote tip, uh, benefits it has. Uh, in studies in, by the way, humans, because there have been human studies with hexarelin, but again, not, don't agree with any of that. He says it's okay to eat food after peptides as long as it's 30 minutes later. You and I both know that peptides work best when they're injected when you are fasting because they cross the blood brain barrier faster, or I'm sorry, more efficiently. And they also get into portal circulation where they can be absorbed more efficiently uh, in the presence of low insulin. So when you say that uh, you can, you know, eat 30 minutes after a peptide, you are going to be blunting again, depending on what that peptide is, you will be blunting somewhat of the GH agonistic effect of that peptide. So that's also not really true. Uh, I'll let you talk about this. He says HGH at a minute and three, he says HGH will definitely give you an unnatural, unpleasant skin texture and permanently change your face. Again, that is coming from science. That is coming from research in the, the people that suffer acromyalgy. And, 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 and Hunter, you know that's relative to the dosage. It's not relative to the type of dosages that you and I recommend. There's a lot of Hollywood celebrities that would uh, prove that wrong if you knew who was using HDH. But yeah, that was just... That was, I think, one of the bigger ones that I just wanted to kind of dispel because obviously both you and I use GH, you know, my girlfriend uses it, like 
you know, I know Monica, like it, it's so far from the truth that like a surgically precise microdose of GH does that to men or women's skin is like beyond belief. But again, like you said, he's just like scraping, you know, these talking points, you know, to kind of well, like fi a final one for sure is our favorite melanotan. I got to, but I'll go to it. So I'm in one fifteen of melanotan. To give you a little bit of background hold on he goes he talks about it doesn't have mental or cognitive effects but melanotan 2 does oh my god yeah, let's so just listen to this play, for a second. play that real quick yeah yeah hold on All right. us as well so there are essentially five different synthetic peptides called melanotan one two three four and five each of which is designed to mimic melanocyte simulating hormone but each of which activates different receptors to different degrees so you guys that are watching this if you're still watching us with this you're listening to a man who doesn't know what he's talking about he has no experience using melanotan one two three four five melanotan one and melanotan two are by the way the only peptides available so he has no idea what he's talking about but again you can just tell by his body language and the way he's speaking about these things he's first off tired because this is the end of the podcast and he's also been reading this and he's just clearly uncomfortable. He's giving you that kind of like, oh, I want to just get through this because I don't know jack shit about what I'm talking about. And some can cross the blood brain barrier and some can't. And as a consequence, some impact mood and libido and others don't. See how he's reading as he says that? <laughs> he literally is reading it. So this is where he's now not on the teleprompter and he's looking down at his notes and he's looking up and he's looking down. And he's like, hey, look, man, I'm not making fun of him. I'm, I'm being honest. I've been there. You've been there. When you don't have a mastery of the subject matter, this is how it comes off. For those of you guys that are big fans of Andrew Huberman, if this is what you are attracted to, a non-subject matter expert, then that's cool. Then, you know. That's not what I'm attracted to. I know that's not what Hunter's attracted to. I know that's not what the majority of our audience is. I wouldn't be where I was in this world today if people weren't attracted to the information that I had that comes from my experiential body of work, my in the trenches with these products or these agents for 20 years. I'm saying two decades. Hunter is close to one decade. Okay. We're not up here giving you science breakdowns of these peptides because we don't have to, because we know how they are used. We know how they work in us. And then we relate them back to you guys from our experience. I mean, literally, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, is there, should I play any more about what he's saying? Yeah, say just play it. Just it I, I want you to hear what he says right here. Okay. So keep playing right. it for a couple more seconds. The simple way to look at this is that melanotan one does not cross the blood brain barrier. It does, however, stimulate the melanocytes of the skin, so it leads to tanning or darkening of the skin. That's literally complete bullshit. We'll keep going, keep going. Melanotan 2, 3, 4, and 5 also lead to darkening of the skin by way of activating melanocytes in the skin. But because they can cross the blood-brain barrier, they cause effects that are at the level of psychology, really, and at the level of appetite and things of that sort. In general, the pattern is to increase... What? Yeah. So if for anyone that's like had practical use, I'll say this, like a melanotan one versus melanotan two, there's obviously like a profound well-being enhancement to consciousness and your overall like vitality and outlook on life from melanotan one. I've heard countless stories of people anecdotally report to me that it enhanced their um, anxiety, reduced their anxiety and depression and everything. Because now I'm not going to get into a scientific debate of whether it crosses the blood brain barrier or not. I don't <laughs> have to. Because I've used melanotan one and I know what it does and I've used melanotan two and I know what it does. And I know melanotan one is absolutely one of the most profound agents for me to enhance my connection with source consciousness through the cosmos because I'm able to enhance the information that I receive from the sun, aka light. And it enhances the ability for me to download that information from the sun and integrate it into my consciousness. So whether it crosses the blood brain barrier or not, I don't know. And I don't well, really let me care. Just ask you this. But, all that stuff you just said is beautiful and true. How would it not cross the blood brain <laughs> barrier if what you just said was false? Uh, I mean, it's again, it, deductive reasoning. Yeah. It's logical. Again, he's getting his information from science textbooks or doctors or research or Reddit or God knows where, which clearly proves he has not ever used melanotan one. I mean, I have said this in my book, which as you know, has been erased off of Google. Dr. Frank Barr, who was one of the pioneering researchers of melanin cortoid receptor complexes, was thrown off a building in the 70s in Berkeley, California. 
I don't know why. I mean, I'm sure it was a suicide, right? Because people suicide themselves that happen to research things that are very important in the uh, ontological enhancement of the human species. But like, it, it's just crazy, bro. Like that is where we'll end the podcast because when I hear stuff like that, I'm over it. Like, I'm just like, dude, that doesn't even make sense. Have you ever injected melanotan one? You just proved it, it. It's it's profound. I mean, it's literally one of our favorite peptides. Yes, it will brown your skin, but the, that's the minimized effect of all of the psychogenic effects you free you you receive from melanin what melanotan one, which is again in the enhancing consciousness. Anyone who's a meditator who does an inner work practice and uses melanotan one will tell you the same thing. It's like you said, bro, it's a life altering profound change. Yeah. I actually injected some yesterday and it was Sunday. It was a holiday. I went with my girlfriend out into the, into nature with a 53 pound backpack on my back and went hiking for an hour and a half. And it's one of the most profound experiences because you feel you can literally feel nature vibrating with you and communicating with you after you've injected melanotan one. And it's not in a way that you're tripping on psychedelics or anything, but it's just the connection that we all have and are meant to have. And it's because it was really sunny yesterday and the weather was amazing. And it allowed me to one, get a little bit better tan. And then also to like feel that amazing feeling and just feel connected with nature and everything. So I mean, again, theory versus practice, that's all I'll say, but also to, you know, does the matrix want people to uh, feel that feeling that I felt yesterday with Melantan 1 or that I have on a right. regular basis? Of course not. So why are they going to uh, promote it? They're going to obfuscate it and distort it. I so. mean, I mean, bro, I'll just wrap this up. You can have the final thoughts. First off, if this if this information is valuable to you guys, you know, you're not a Jay Campbell or Hunter Williams fan or audience member, and somehow this video got to you and you did find a lot of value in this video, which if you're half awake, you should. Uh, join us in our private membership group fullyoptimizedhealth.com. You can see here on the, it's linked in the bottom and it'll also be linked in the description. But every single week, Hunter and I do live shows on Tuesday night, answering your questions, talking about deeper consciousness, enhancing things and spirituality and all sorts of stuff. We also do all sorts of like free, not free, but if you're a member of the group, it's free to you. Uh, live webinars. And of course, everything is recorded. We've got over 400 people now. We just crossed the 400 uh, person barrier inside the group. Men and women, it's not just for guys, it's for men and women who are biohacking their best life. So again, if this is valuable to you, please join us in our group. It's $99 a month or actually only $249 a quarter. It is easily worth that money in, in cost. Um, I'll just, you know, go back to sum it up to say that, you know, I respect Andrew Huberman for doing what he's doing out there, but he is definitely not an expert when it comes to peptides his podcast that you know just wrapped or whatever highly edited you know highly scrubbed uh and and ran today uh well today you and i are doing this i think this is going to run on our channel on the fourth which will be thursday but it, this was published today on, on monday april 1st april fool's day of course uh do not be fooled um he is not an expert on peptides and the information that he is putting out is clearly designed to make people cautious and fearful of using peptides and bro i want you to summarize this and wrap this up but you and i both know that peptides are the crypto of healthcare they are a new form of decentralized healthcare that anyone can access to anyone can access and utilize with a broadband internet connection and a form of payment to purchase these products and have them shipped to your house. Again, always, as always, buyer beware, but there's no reason to be fearful of peptides. I'll let you wrap and summarize. Yeah, I'll say, I know this episode could have come across as like a personal attack and that is absolutely the last of our intentions. We just wanted, and my intention with even breaking all that down was to help people be able to discern truth for themselves. And I'm not the source of truth. Jay's not the source of truth. No person will ever be able to be that. You have to be your own source of truth and take the information that we talk about that Andrew Huberman talks about, whatever. So in no way am I like trying to cast stones at him or anything. I hope people listen to him because at the very least, this podcast that he did is going to get out to, I'm sure, millions and millions of people. At the very least, some people around the planet are going to wake up to the power of peptides. And like Jay said, peptides are the embodiment of what is happening in crypt or finance to crypto of what is happening in healthcare. And peptides are allowing people to take health and wellness and well-being into their own hands. And by whatever happenstance it came to be, Jay and I are some of the people that talk about that and happen to be, you know, like, you know, use case experts on it. So again, we're not the source of truth, but we just have our own personal experience that we share and hope to teach people. So don't look at this as like a personal attack because a lot of times Jay 
will claim that, you know, that, or people will claim that that's what Jay and I are doing. And it's not, we are just are really passionate about trying to help people become, you know, like the sovereign entity that controls their own health. And when I see information like this, it just like, it's something burns with it inside me to try to like rectify and, you know, at the very least in like the way that I can correct it. So like, if this gets out, you know, to like a bigger audience than we're used to getting out to, like, just know that and know that like, you know, I don't have all of the answers. I'm on this journey, like anyone else listening to this. So um, know that, and, you know, like we're, we're all learning, including Andrew Huberman, you know, like we're all out here learning life is lessons and learning is fun. So that's all I'll say. And, you know, like Jay said, if you like this type of stuff, we don't have teleprompters. We don't have like fancy show notes <laughs> or anything like that. We just Not have yet. our own personal experience. We get on and we talk about this. This is what our group is about. This is like what all of our videos are about. So this was not scripted or anything. We just had, you know, like some notes that I took on it and we just rolled on it. So that's how we roll. <laughs> yeah, man. Awesome, dude. So um, again, I'm Jay Campbell. He's Hunter Williams. We appreciate you guys watching. We will see you guys very soon.